here I go. Hello friends and welcome back to the Impossible Challenge series. Today we're taking a dive into Gran Turismo 4 to see if we can beat the game without buying a single car. I thought about seeing if we could beat it only buying a truck and spending money on nothing else, but I don't think that's possible. And so we're going to attempt something I think is possible. Thanks to everyone once again for the comments from my previous videos. I appreciate all of your feedback. I definitely plan on implementing some of it where I can. Case in point, two of the things I want to implement are less menuing and more of a plan heading into runs. If you've been keeping up with the Impossible Challenge series and have enjoyed it so far, consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already for more challenges and interesting videos coming up soon. I have some really cool ideas coming up that I think you'll like. Speaking of cool things you'll like, you might have noticed I said we're not going to buy a single car and the savvy veterans among you might already be headed to the comment section to tell me that's impossible in this game. Well, before we do anything else, we're going to jump into this video's DJ life lesson with a little thing called confirmation bias. In so many words, confirmation bias basically means that when you believe something is true, you tend to ignore data suggesting it isn't true and latch on to data that says it is true, even if data suggesting it isn't true is overwhelming. For instance, I don't think a truck is a car. Let's Google it and find out. Uh, well, we're not gonna look at that one. Aha, see, I told you a truck isn't a car. Thanks Ars Technica confirmation bias. I say all that to say I am pretending that trucks are not cars for the sake of making this video more fun, but we will still have to see if we can beat this game without buying any other vehicles, except for a truck, which we'll get to in a little bit. As per usual, we're operating under speedrun.com rules and that beating the game equals beating the Gran Turismo World Championship. Also, as per usual, we need a free car and conveniently this game offers you a bunch of them and they don't all require getting golds on license tests. So as part of the plan, we're not going to get gold on any of the license tests. This game gives you a separate car for each license, depending on if you get all bronze, all silver and all gold so we can jump right ahead and say we got the b license which gives us the volkswagen lupo we got the a license which gives us a pontiac sunfire gxp concept we get the international b license which gives us that fancy nike one car and then we get the international a license that gives us a nismo 270r from 1994 one of these four cars will be relevant to the run and possibly even necessary to the run. You'll find out which one it is here in a little bit. But first, we're going to go back to the IA license, and I want to talk a little bit about what I had to go through during almost the entirety of this run. So you'll notice in the bottom left, the controller's not there. So I got a PS3. It was backwards compatible. I played Gran Turismo 4 on it. It was really cool. I had to jerry-rig my setup to work with the PS3 because the PS3 has HTCP built in and occasionally this would happen. Yes. No signal from my capture card. Now, I managed to handle it gracefully here, but there is a license test coming up that is quite long. And I ask you, what do you think would happen in the middle of a lap at the Nordschleife? Yeah, we fail because even though I caught it with a pause, I had put one wheel into the grass and crashed anyway. So as you can imagine, very frustrating when you have to take one lap around the entire Nordschleife, which is a very fun course. But if you end up on a corner when the capture card cuts off, 
Nothing you can do. You gotta do it again. This was my third attempt, and my second one, I failed seven and a half minutes in, and the capture card did not crash. And you can imagine, I was very, very, very upset with that. But, we carry on, and we managed to complete it a few attempts later. It all took me about half an hour just to do this one test. This is the second to last test in IA. And I don't really have any proof to back this up, but my theory was that my capture card was overheating. It's never done this before, and so I don't know if that was happening or if something weird with the signal that it was getting, because I had a component to HDMI converter between my capture card and the PS3. The thing is, there was no consistency to this, and the last few hours of the run, it didn't black out at all. So I really have no idea what was going on. My theory was that my capture card was just overheating and that's what was happening. I can't, I don't know what else it could be. In any case, in a normal run, we would be taking one of the cars we got from the license test and seeing what we can do with it. But this game gives us free cars in other ways. And so that is where we are going to start this run in the driving missions. And since I had a plan coming into this, I was looking for a very specific set of driving missions, the Slipstream Battles. You can win five different prize cars from completing certain sections here in the missions. And this one in particular, you know, when I made this plan, I had this crazy genius idea based on my knowledge of the previous Gran Turismo games. This first Slipstream Battle is in the Cube. I think it's a Nissan Cube. These slipstream battles, for the most part, are pretty straightforward. I've sped this up because I want to show it, at least part of it. But really, you just follow behind the car in front of you, and eventually the toe starts to pick up, and you will eventually pass all of the remaining cars here in this one. So, anyway, we're going to do this mission with the cube, and going back to what I was saying about the GT World Championships and all, I had this genius idea. I did my research, I felt like I can get this car, I have the IA license, I can hop right into the Gran Turismo World Championship and win it in no time. Now, the savvy veterans among you may know whether or not that's possible, but that was the idea. That was the idea I had going in, that this car, it's good, I think it'll help me, it'll be plenty good enough. And so that's what we went for. So as you can see, just like I said, you know, I've sped this up, but you really just go around and then immediately fall in line behind the second one. So we move on to the next challenge, which is the same thing, but in a van, a little bit of a faster vehicle, but the same idea. You start in a big line and then you have one lap to basically slipstream around the other five cars and then you're good. So I had this genius plan. I looked up the speedrun world record and it was eight hours long and I thought, wow, I can beat this game in like four hours. I'm a genius. So, but first we have to beat these slipstream battles. And so I'm thinking in my head, oh, I've just got this sweet plan and nobody thought of this ahead of time and etc., etc., etc. If you like humble pie, well, you'll be seeing that serve to me shortly. So we go again. Easy peasy, just around the cars, no problem. Now we're going to jump ahead to the fourth Slipstream Battle Challenge, sped up even more, because this one is three laps. This one in the Amuse S2000, this is a very fast car. This one was especially fun because you are chasing fifth place and then there's just this moment where suddenly you hit the toe and your car just rockets forward. It's a really cool thing. I don't know if that's realistic, but at least in this game it was cool, and the audio changes whenever you get close. But it's the same idea, so you just kind of follow the car in front of you until you finally pick up enough of the slipstream to where your car rockets forward, and then you just do that until the very end, which will be happening here in just a moment. This one takes about five minutes. Honestly, it's probably a little too long. Maybe it would have been more interesting if this was only two laps and the cars were a little a little closer. Those screen flashes are actually me looking backwards, but because this is sped up five times. And then I also found out that this game has penalties, which you may have seen flash on the screen for a moment. 
five second penalty for ramming the car too much. That'll become relevant later. And now we hop over to slipstream number three. And wait a minute, what is this? Why are all the cars bunched up? For some goofy reason, Mr. Turismo decided to make this a completely different slipstream battle from the other three, and you have to work in tandem with the AI in order to catch that lone car way out in front. This was my second attempt. My first attempt, I backed out early because I was stunned, for lack of a better word, at this. But I wasn't really sure what to do, and so... Eventually, you know, I see I'm looking behind me here. I'm thinking maybe I can get the AI to bump draft me. They come up, they use the slipstream from my car and then they bump me and eventually we catch the car in front. You know, we have three laps. That was the first idea. And then what I eventually settled on is something born straight out of NASCAR where this game, the way the physics work is that you can essentially latch on to the back of another car and push it. This is called tandem drafting, and it was actually outlawed in NASCAR back in 2014 because of a nasty crash that happened while two cars were tandem drafting, and it actually injured some fans because the car got airborne. Now it is outlawed in NASCAR, but Mr. Turismo doesn't know any better, and so we are going to attempt to push an AI around the track. That was the idea, and at the end of the first attempt at this, I try to slingshot myself around the AI, but you may have noticed just then that the AI bumps the brakes going into a corner at test course. I have no idea what Mr. Turismo was thinking, programming the AI to slow down on a course like this, but that does come into play for the slingshot that's about to happen, or rather would happen if I hadn't gotten myself a little boxed in and then bumped the rear of the skyline in front of me. The thing about this test is that the AI kind of limits its speed around the corners, so it won't draft up on you if you're in front of them in the corners. And I know that this is pretty much a dead attempt, and so I'm going to go ahead and retry. Jumping ahead to the end of my next attempt, I get a little bit better of a slingshot and you can see the first place car out in the distance, but it's not quite enough. I still end up about two seconds behind. So now we jump to my next attempt, which shows what else can go wrong. But I had another idea to try and make this group of cars like a Peloton in the Tour de France where the person in the back goes to the front and then everyone else drafts and then they kind of have this cyclical thing going on. But at this point, I hadn't realized that the AI limits its speed in the corners and so I got going too fast and left them behind, which was another failed attempt. And so I went back to the tandem drafting thinking if I could just do that right from the very beginning, I could make this work. And so as we move on to the next attempt, it's time to play the numbers game, just like we've had in my other challenge videos. You've seen me attempt this three times, and if you're familiar with this challenge, you've probably noticed that I'm not doing it correctly. Despite the fact that this attempt you're watching got me within seven tenths of a second. If I had done it a little bit better, I could have maybe made it work. So. Time to guess, how many attempts do you think it took me to complete this challenge? Think of a number, leave a comment, tell me how many you think it might have been. Get a number in your head. Got a number? Good. Because this challenge only took me nine attempts. Compared to some of my other videos, that's not that many. Really, there weren't that many things in this run that took me a ton of attempts. but. We have to play the numbers game. You know how it works by now. Nine attempts. Before I got on this run, which I did the next day, after I watched a YouTube video of someone else doing it, and it turns out the Peloton strategy is actually the way to go. So I'm not going to show you the entire run, but I'm going to show you the idea. So you saw me go flying past the AI, but this time you can see me feathering the throttle a little bit 
You want to get down to about 164, 163. That's roughly the speed the AI carries through the corner. You want to give them a, a decent gap, but you don't want to leave them behind. And the idea is that you want one or two AI cars to come flying up on you and pass you, and then you immediately tuck into the toe of them after they pass you. And the idea is that you just gain more ground that way than tandem drafting. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it seemed to work better. So here we go. Here comes the black skyline. I dive out of the way because they're not going to get out of the way. And then I immediately tuck into the toe and then get bodied by the red skyline. But you can see I'm starting to pick up speed. And by the end of the corner, we're going to be going a little bit faster than we were in tandem drafting. My guess is that you get up to a higher speed quicker than just with tandem drafting. Or maybe I was just doing the tandem drafting wrong. But in any case, we tuck in front of the AI once again, get down to about 165. Try to maintain a little bit of a gap. And as we fast forward ahead to the end of this corner, we're going to do the same thing again. And then eventually we do this strategy enough times and then we blow past the AI car in front as if it was standing still. This ended up being three or four or five seconds faster than the tandem drafting method, but I think honestly it's because the AI limits its speed in the corners. I could not get it to go faster than 163 in the corners, even though I was tandem drafting it, and so I think the AI was feathering its throttle there. Which is annoying because I feel like the tandem drafting should have worked and I don't really know why this one out of four challenges was different. You would think the final challenge would have also been different in some other way, but it really wasn't. So it was just longer, three laps instead of one. But as we fast forward ahead to the end, you can see I won this one easily and we have our first usable car. It is the Pagani Zonda LM race car. And my genius self is thinking, aha, I have a race car. I have the IA license. Let's go beat the game and we'll have a short and sweet video and we can celebrate our free time. But then my hopes were dashed as off camera I went and looked and yes, you have to beat all of the beginner and professional race challenges before you can attempt the Gran Turismo World Championship. So my dreams of holding a world record were shattered. And instead, you're going to get to watch a man suffer. So this is the normal Rally D'Umbria. As you can see, it's a 1.8 a spec race. It's not like this race was hard, but this is the Sita di Area track. I may be pronouncing that wrong. It may be Sita, Sita di Area. And in a race car, with a city track this narrow, it was an absolutely miserable experience. So I'm going to use this time to do a little bit of my favorite monologuing to set the scene for the rest of the run. So you could see there I used partial brake. I'm actually using the right stick for throttle and brake. That was someone else's idea. It was a, it was a comment that I had. So you could see I'm already suffering. Missed a brake point, then got a penalty, then got hit by the AI. Not exactly in that order, but I think maybe a couple folks had recommended this. and. It was a little weird at first. I mean, this is some of the first racing I've done outside of the license test, but I started to get used to it a little bit as the run went on. It was actually a really great idea. So whoever left that comment, absolutely thank you for that. It ended up being great. This, however, is one of the worst experiences I've had in gaming, period, because my racer self wants to go fast. And because I don't know this track, stuff like that happens. You just, this car is way, way too fast for this track. And on top of that, I don't really know the track. And so I don't know how this looks to viewers, but I was not a happy camper every single time I had to race on this track. It was absolutely miserable right here. An example of what I mean. So that looks terrible, right? I slammed into the wall for a lot of these tracks that I'm, I'm not familiar with that were in games that were before Gran Turismo 7. I was relying on the gear indicator to really help me out, to warn me when stuff was coming up. And on that one corner where I absolutely smashed the wall, the gear indicator doesn't even come up until it's too late. And so when you're relying on these things, I mean, look, I hit the wall again. This was every single instance of this track was like this for me. It was terrible. When you're relying on things like that, 
and the thing isn't all that well programmed, you end up having a miserable experience. And then there are times where the brake, the gear indicator, and it flashing would come up too early and I could brake way later. It wasn't consistent at all. And it really made for a frustrating experience. As someone that I try not to rely on these things too much, but I don't do a lot of practice. I mean, this is me playing this track. I don't remember if it was in the license test or not, but this is one of the first times I'm playing this track and it's in a car that's way faster than in the license test. And so I just am not familiar with it. And it makes for a really miserable experience to the point where I'm like, why is this track even in the game? It's not even two cars wide. So that's kind of what I was thinking and feeling here. And you're seeing it happen as if this was the first time, as I'm experiencing this for the pretty much the first time in a car that's really fast. Just see, look, I broke really early that time and it was too early. I would, I would struggle with that corner every single time. And then this one, it's really frustrating. And I think on top of that also is the way that, that cars start out. So the, the ASM and the TCS starts, I think it's 10 and five. So it's like 10 out of 20 for the ASM. And then the TCS is five out of 10. I think that affects the cars a lot. And I did tinker with that a little bit in some other challenges in this run but I think it really caused some kind of gnarly understeer and in a track like this, just never going to work out right. And so we won this and we're gonna jump ahead to the end of the reverse layout where we had to beat this and the forward layout to win the car that we want. And the prize car we get is a Lancia Delta rally car. Wait a minute, this isn't what I wanted. Oh, for crying out loud. I looked at the wrong thing in the prize car list. So I went through one of the worst experiences I've ever had in gaming for no reason. Yes. Thank you, past DJ. Thank you for that. Future DJ really, really appreciates that. And now we're going to go do what we meant to do, which is the rally at Costa de Amalfi. One cool thing about this game that actually made this run possible is that not every rally event requires dirt tires. So this is a paved track, much like the previous one. We're going to use the Zonda again. This, of course, was no contest. I mean, that's an, a Lancer Evo road car. But one thing about this track that I found really interesting, I actually kind of enjoyed this one because of the scenery and all. This track has a really crazy jump in it, which you're going to see in just a moment. I absolutely loved going as fast as possible. There it is. You get airborne for a couple seconds there. I loved hitting that as fast as possible just to see how ridiculously far you could fly. It was a lot of fun. This track also really narrow, but it just felt a lot more pleasant to drive than the last one. I actually like this one. You kind of go up a mountain and then the other half of the track is that you come down the mountain and it's all this kind of area with houses and stuff very cool but for the interest of keeping this video as short as possible we're going to jump ahead to the end of the reverse layout where of course we won easily and that will lead to the first car in a chain of cars that will do a lot of heavy lifting for this run Subaru Impreza rally car prototype from 2001 from here, I started the Sunday Cup and did the first two races with the Nismo 270, but my capture card was blacking out so much, I elected to give it a few hours rest and come back to my new favorite track, Cita di Area, in Rally di Umbria, easy. Turns out I was kind of looking at the prize card list correctly, but I did the wrong difficulty, so I get to suffer through this again, and I won't put you through that again. We're going to skip to the end of the reverse portion of this challenge where I meet some fans up close and personal and ruin my driver's family's Christmas. And this fellow looks absolutely shocked to see a race car this cool up close. And this awards us the Cadillac CN, a car that I thought was front engine rear wheel drive, but it's actually mid engine rear wheel drive. And we're going to hop over to the MR challenge and knock out all five races. The CN has an absolutely wild amount of horsepower. It has over 700 horsepower. 
In the cars in the MR Challenge, the opponents have like 200 horsepower, and so you can imagine how that went. Five easy victories. And that rewards us with the Lotus Esprit from 1987. Really neat car. I do love a good Lotus. Next up, we're going to finish the Sunday Cup with the Cadillac CN. Really not interesting video, so I'm just going to show you the end of the fifth Sunday Cup race. And that rewards us with an Auto Bianchi A112 Abarth from 1979. And we're going to take this and we're going to attempt the lightweight K Cup. This ended up being another moderately sized hurdle to the run, at least for the moment. First thing you may have noticed is that the A spec points were greater than one. So if you're not familiar with this game, basically this game calculates how difficult the race is and assigns you A spec points based on your car versus the power and all that other stuff handling of the AI cars. And another thing you'll notice, and I, I can't recall if I mentioned it before, but basically my driving standards in this run were a little bit more uh, wild, for lack of a better term, than they were, they were in my previous runs. And really, part of it is because, as we'll get to in a little bit, the AI in this game is absolutely terrible to deal with. It is abysmal to deal with. They will turn in like you're not even there. And so, this is my first attempt at the Motorland track in the K Cup. And you can see there's only four laps and I'm not really making any progress. So part of it for me is just, I have to learn the car. I'm not familiar with this track and with no upgrades, I have to figure out is the AI using upgraded cars, things like that. And so my first attempt is not going very well. And you can see I sneak in, I kind of elbow the AI out of the way. This is where I figure out, there's an example. I break a little early, a little gingerly, and the AI just does their best Kimi Velocini impression and bumps me out of the way. Real ones know. But anyway, this is where I figure out how late I can break in some car. So it's a mixture of that and in between races, I went and did a bunch of menuing and I turned down the ASM and TCS on this car in particular because I'm thinking I don't need help from the game for traction control and things like that. I still left it on a little, but I figured that some of my mid speed cornering might be improved if I turn down the stability stuff for a car that really doesn't need it. You'll also notice that now I am on a different race. I'm on Sakuba circuit. I went back and tried to determine if maybe because I know this track a little bit better, if I could get a better result using this car. And as we fast forward ahead to the final lap, you'll see that I I bump into the back of the Honda Beat, which I have said in previous videos I don't really want to do, so I didn't take the position. But as I gain some momentum, the Beat cuts me off in a little bit of karmic revenge, and I lose some momentum. And here's pretty much when I know that the race is lost. And at the time, I was so annoyed with the beat cutting me off, I decided to have my own little spat of revenge. And then we go again. So we go again on Sakuba, and the kicker to this and a lot of the races in this game is that you just have to outbreak the AI. You can see how long the gear indicator was flashing before I pressed the brakes there. That's kind of what you have to do. Some of this really is just trial and error. You kind of have to screw up your braking with it, whether you're braking too early or too late to figure out when the right time to brake is and then use that to your advantage because the AI in this game will brake really early for no reason. And you can gain so much time on faster cars that way. And so Already in lap one, we're making a little bit of progress. Get the elbows out once again. You're going to see me try and outbreak this car here as we go into the final hairpin. Look at how late you can break in this car, and then you just turn in with it. That's the beauty of these K Cup cars. You can really just throw them around and they respond really nicely because they're so slow. And then here, we get in the toe of the cars in front on this long straightaway, and even though it's not a huge difference, it does still matter. To show you what I mean, we fast forward to turn one of lap two. Watch how much time I gain on the car in front. 
now we're right on the bumper of them. I actually leave it in third gear this time because the gear changes are really slow in these cars and you can gain a little bit of time if you do it right. And we get past that pesky Honda Beat heading into the left-hander here. Another example, I end up having to kind of avoid the car in front because it broke so early. And with a little skillful driving, we end up winning this race relatively easily. Then we jump onto the third race, which is at the Driving Park Beginner Course. Not much to talk about in this one. If you just break later than the AI, you eventually catch them and overcome them. And that one's an easy victory. Now we're going to go back to the first track, the Driving Park Motorland Course. This one was tough, and this one... I really want to talk about the concept of possible opponents. I've mentioned this before, but this game has a pool of cars that can be opponents in most of the races that you will do. And sometimes you just have to kind of keep restarting until you find the right AI cars that you can beat. It's not quite that simple as starting position sometimes matters for how fast the cars are, but Pretty much the idea is that sometimes there is a certain selection of AI cars that you can handle that you might not be able to handle with other selections of cars. I don't really exploit it here, but it will become relevant later, and as far as I'm concerned, if the game allows it, then it's allowed in a challenge run, as you see some very egregious driving there. If it makes you feel any better, I ended up abandoning this race because I couldn't catch the car in front because it was one of those cars that I simply just could not catch due to how fast it was. Then on my next attempt, we win with a different set of AI opponents and then we're gonna hop back in the Cadillac CN and do the MR challenge. And this one's for you, classic Gran Turismo folks. I was so far ahead, felt like I would take a chunk out of Trial Mountain just like the good old days. Really no reason for me to do that. I was so far ahead, I just thought I would do that and throw it in the video to make a few people smile because we know we all used to do it when we were kids, right? Like, nothing was off limits off camera, you know. That earns us the Honda NSXR concept, which is another car that will be relevant later. But for now, the next step is to do the S license. But before we do that, we're gonna have a little bit of fun in the Cone Maze Challenge. Huh you won't be disqualified by hitting the walls. That sounds kind of fun. All right, well, let's see what happens. Wait a minute, that said, I won't be disqualified by hitting the walls. What kind of nonsense is that? What, who programmed this? Mr. Turismo, whose fault is this? And then we went and got the super license. Despite the lies that were told to us, we got the super license, which will give us another car that will be relevant later. The Mercury Cougar XR7 from 1967. Now we're gonna hop in the Cougar after some menuing and do the World Classic Car Series. This was pretty much a blowout. None of the races were even close. You can see I got 50 points out of the five races. This is a good car for this. It's just cars before 1970. And this rewards us with one of the funnier vehicles across any Gran Turismo, the Mercedes-Benz motor carriage from 1886. Absolutely hilarious that this is in any of these games. Now we're gonna hop in the Janetta G4 that we got from the K Cup and attempt the World Compact Race. And so this was really one of the first scary moments that in the run in that the Janetta is about half as powerful and also weighs about half what the other AI cars have. And so my hope was that even though I'm underpowered, I mean, you can see them pulling away I could use the fact that the Janetta is so light to carry more speed through the corners and break way later and make up the ground that way. So you can see I kind of mess up turn one, but we don't hit the wall or anything, so we carry on. 
real quick, I know we're a ways into this video, but I wanted to mention something I've been meaning to talk about. Why I chose to do this challenge this way. So why I chose to say not buying a car as opposed to not upgrading cars or only spending a certain amount of money because I feel like this was the hardest way to do this challenge and it still be possible. And what I mean by that is if you open yourself up to spending X number of credits or not using the upgrade station, if you will, if not upgrading any cars, you allow yourself to essentially have pretty much every car available that you can buy to more or less get out of fail free. Whereas a challenge like this, you're basically stuck with what the game gives you. And so for me, I felt like that made this challenge a little bit harder. There's no real easy one size fits all difficult challenge for this. It's not like that anyone else did it incorrectly per se. This was just my way of trying to make it as hard as possible on myself. And so that's what I did. People may or may not wonder why I did it this way. That was my own personal reasoning. It's nothing against anyone else. It is just the way that I wanted to do it. And so you can see we're up to P2 now toward the end of lap one. We're just sneaking by the AI. We haven't done anything real dirty. We're just using the fact that this car weighs nothing and handles pretty nicely to slowly make up ground on the AI. And we'll go ahead and fast forward to the end of this race. And yes, I did end up winning without too much trouble. You know, you have three laps, and so it wasn't too bad. The Janetta handles beautifully, and so as long as you keep it mistake-free, you should be fine. We're going to go ahead and fast forward to the end of the third race. The, the, the three races overall weren't too terribly bad. Like I said, as long as you just keep it clean with the Janetta, all will be good. And then that rewards us with the Honda S800 RSC race car, which I think would be fun to see go around the Nordschleife a few times. Next on the list is the Pagani Zonda in the Tuning Car Grand Prix. You can pretty much enter whatever you want in here. This was also a blowout. I mean, the Zonda is a really, really good car. Really nothing to talk about with these races. Five easy victories. And the prize for that, very, very important car, the Nissan Option Stream Z from 2004. But first, we hop back in the CN and win the Clubman Cup. Once again, absolutely no problem at all. The Clubman Cup awards us with a car we are not going to use, a Mazda Mazda Speed 6 from 2005. Next up on the docket, the FF Challenge. And let me tell you, this one was legitimately difficult. So I chose the Pontiac Sunfire that you get from one of the licenses. I believe it was the A license, getting all bronze. As you can see, 122 A-spec points up for grabs. That means... The car that I'm using is pretty disadvantaged compared to the rest of the cars. Usually a good metric for how things are going to go or whether or not I catch the AI off the line. And as you can see, I really haven't. And so we're going on midfield raceway reverse. I'm just trying to see if this car is even possible to use. And then I end up making a mistake and well, you can see how this starts. I go for a really terrible, nasty dive and then I'm like, yeah. That wasn't a clean enough move for me, so we're going to try again. And the strategy for this, like all the other races, comes down to can I outbreak the AI and can I drive cleanly enough to maintain good speed through the corners? So we're going to try again, and this time, once we get to this first series of corners, I know that first AI car is going to break a little early. And so to that end, I'm going to think about trying to take an alternative line into turn one, or I guess turn two. So here you'll see, I stay to the left. I know that the car, the AI car is going to break early. Then I'm going to sweep under the set of AI and try to dive under the others. That was kind of a dirty trick, but because this car is so disadvantaged under power, look, I end up giving a position back anyway. And so this is also kind of a practice run. You know, I part of it is when I have this much of a problem in terms of like car performance compared to the AI, I kind of just have to keep trying. So that one I slammed into the back of the AI and I decided, yeah, I was being dirty again. So we're on to attempt number three. And this is a good example as to why I did not want to do a challenge that would just open me up to buying a car that would get me out of this mess. Could I upgrade this car? Absolutely. If it came down to it, if I felt like I could not win this with any other prize car or this car, Yes, I could upgrade it. The The challenge 
for me is to also try and do this as cheaply as possible. We're going to do that same dive where I get my elbows out. That was kind of a dirty dive, to be honest. I'll, I'll admit to that. But this is why I didn't want to just open it up to having a credit limit or banning myself from upgrades because then I could just buy a fancy front wheel drive car that just handles this mess and then carry about the challenge like nothing happened. So I'm trying to do this as cheaply as possible while also allowing myself to upgrade some cars if there really is no hope at all. And as you can see, I'm now into P1. I have figured it out. I think there is hope. And we're going to fast forward a little bit to the end of this lap and you'll see what I mean when I say I have just a major performance discrepancy between me and the AI. You can see I'm looking behind me at the start finish straight here. There's a pretty good gap to the second place car, but as I peek behind me once again, you'll see it's starting to get closer as we get to the finish line, getting closer and closer, less than a second now. This is kind of a concern, although I do make it to the twisty bits, which means I will be able to use some of my car's performance advantage. You see how the brake indicator was blinking and I didn't brake at all there. Down into second gear, we're going to be looking behind me quite a lot. Look at how close the AI has gotten. I was way ahead when the lap started. So now we go through this full throttle section here, still looking behind, still looking behind. We have one more really long straight to go where the AI can catch me. Lead is down to half a second. We're gonna jump to that spot. On other attempts, the AI would catch me through here, but one thing about this game and one thing that makes these challenges possible is that the AI is really, really bad in certain situations. And on this situation, it was bad. See, we're up to a second and a half lead. And then we fast forward ahead to the end and we do win by over two seconds. Sometimes the AI just does not use the fact that it has way better cars. That would have made these challenges a lot more difficult. Out of respect for your time, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to the end of the fifth front wheel drive front engine race. Just know that all five of these races were roughly the same and that I was dealing with a slightly underpowered car that handled better than the AI cars and I could brake later than the AI cars. And so you could pretty much just use that to your advantage. I mean, you see this was only a two second victory. You don't have that many laps either. And so you really have to drive the car properly in order to have a chance. But that does award us the Mazda Mazda 6 concept from 2001. We're not going to use that one. We're going to hop in the Subaru Rally car over to the Stars of Pleiades One Make Cup, which isn't exactly a One Make Cup, but it has to do with Imprezas. Because this is a race car against road cars, five easy victories, but this is going to give us a car that absolutely will matter. The Subaru Impreza Super Touring car from 2001. And now we're going to do a little bit of shopping. This challenge is not possible without spending any money because you have to buy a truck. There's no way to win a truck. And so I went with the Ford SVT F-150 Lightning. To me, it was the best truck. I didn't really get caught up in caring whether or not I could do it with the worst truck possible. I just looked at all the available trucks and said this one was the best. This one was the one I was going to spend money on and we were going to call it that. So we end up buying the SVT F-150. Then we're gonna hop in the Subaru Impreza Touring Car and buy Sports Soft Tires for a grand total of 43,050 credits in this little shopping spree. We're not done shopping for the run, but we're done shopping for now. We're gonna hop in the Impreza Touring Car and knock out the three Boxer Spirit races. Three, all three were blowouts, really nothing to talk about here. I didn't think the rally car would be good enough and I needed to buy the sports tires anyway. So I went and got the faster touring car. That awards us the roof CTR yellow bird from 1987, which will be relevant later. But now we're gonna hop in the CN and handle the all American championship, or I should say attempt it, where the Janetta before was lighter with less power. We're going to try heavier with more power in the CN, but there is a small problem. 99 A-spec points up for grabs, which means this will be difficult, but I think it might be doable. But the problem is that I'm going against race cars, and I'm not going against road cars, so you see that I get turn one wrong. I feel like I get turn one wrong in pretty much every race I do because the speed at which you enter turn one is never the same from when you enter it normally in a race. You can see I bang off the wall there. I'm trying to follow the chaparral here. 
The problem is I'm driving a boat compared to that car. Trying to keep up, trying to brake later, but the thing is they have racing brakes and I don't, so I can't really use that to my advantage. And as we jump ahead a lap, we'll see that, yeah, this just isn't going to work. I'm too far behind at this point. I did manage to get into P3, but it wasn't enough. So we're going to do something that we know we can do, which is the sport truck race. And really, these three races, they weren't blowouts. One of the AI opponents is the reward car you get for this, or reward truck in this case, the Silverado SST, which is a much better truck than the SVT Lightning that I have. But as long as you stick to your usual method of learning your braking points and just being smooth you will be able to overcome this as I have and so it wasn't too terribly bad we're on the last corner of the last lap of the third race really the first race at Fuji was kind of tough with the Silverado but the other two weren't too bad like I said just learn your braking points you'll be just fine so that's the sport truck race done, and as I said before, that does reward us with a Chevrolet Silverado SST concept from 2002, and believe it or not, that truck is relevant to this run, and we are going to see exactly how as we jump in the truck and head over to the hot rod competition. Now you just saw it on your screen, 148 A-spec points up for grabs, so you know this race is not going to be easy. My choices were kind of limited as it as it pertained to this race in terms of available cars because it has to be an American car and it has to have normal or sports tires. And this truck, based on how I was looking at power to weight ratios and things like that, this truck, ooh, that was a nasty little dive, wasn't it? This truck had the best opportunity in terms of power to weight that I could find. Of course, it's extremely heavy, but it's also very powerful. And this track has a lot of straight lines. And based on the opponents, I thought it was at least possible. And so we're going to give it a go. But as you can see, we are kind of getting left behind. But my hope is that I can use that late braking strategy, which did not work out very well there because I broke too late. But you can see the strategy. I just have to find my braking points, as I've said many times now, and then just try to use what this truck is good at, which is decent straight line speed. And note that the AI, see that was a much less dirty turn in. Good job, DJ. And then use the tow to kind of pull this truck along in the straightaways. Going to try another dive. See, sometimes I can dive into braking zones without ramming people. So now we're on this long backstretch. You can see that the leader is pulling away. The idea is to just stay in the tow as much as possible and make up time in braking zones. And when you can make time up while braking, you can nullify a lot of the disadvantages your cars have. I've said that a lot through this run. And you can see, look, now I'm right on the back of the AI. And the AI is taking so little speed through the corners, I'm actually going to give it a go on this really long backstretch here, but I know eventually this car is going to take over and then I just tuck right back in the tow and have it carry me along some more. So that's the idea we use to win these three races. And as you can see, 175 A-spec points. This game really doesn't like trucks, but we were able to win all three races and that rewards us with the Chevrolet Chevelle SS 454 from 1970. And we're going to hop in that now and try the Stars and Stripes Challenge. These races are starting to get tough. These aren't gimmies anymore, at least not at the moment. And so in this series especially, it is critical that you try and follow what I've been saying before in that you can break later than the AI and really take advantage of the lack of speed the AI carries through the corner. So we're going to see that here a little bit at the beginning of this race, where you just kind of try and get a feel for how late to break going into turn one. You can't win the race in turn one, but you can certainly lose it, as we like to say. So another thing you can do is you can kind of abuse the traction control and stability management stuff that Gran Turismo gives you by default you can floor it mid-corner and you won't really gain any speed, but you also won't spin out. So there's me getting the elbows out. See, I told you the driving standards on this one were a little bit, a little bit more wild in this one. But in any case, 
we carry on. We're trying to carry some speed through the corners. I'm bouncing off walls, bouncing off Camaros now. Doing a great job of showing you clean and safe racing here from DJ Brohawk. Same deal. So now we go onto the back stretch, and you'll see that I'll start to lose some speed here. And that's kind of something you just have to deal with. Doesn't necessarily feel good when it's happening in that you feel like you're going to get left behind. But if you take advantage of the twisty section here and how little speed the AI carries through, you'll be able to catch up and pass. So here we go down into second gear. You can see how much slower the AI is going. I'm going to sneak inside the Corvette. Elbows out again. Try and sneak inside this GTO here. And we're into P1. Yes, maybe not the cleanest racing you'll see on this channel, but that's the idea. And from the rest of this, this is how the three races went. And so you just kind of have to drive that way. As long as you're not egregiously punting the AI, I think it's allowed. It's hard enough to control cars with a controller in any game, but these older games especially where they hadn't quite figured out how to use controllers the way that they do today, sometimes you'll end up inadvertently kind of sideswiping AI. And If you restarted a run every time you did that, you would never get anything done. So you have my permission to hit the AI as much as you want. And if anyone questions it, you just tell them DJ said so. I will say the Infineon Raceway race, which was the third one, took me a few tries. That one was actually pretty tough in this car until I got a feel for it because that track is very tricky with the way that it unsettles cars over the crest of hills. But we made it work, and that unlocks a very important car for us, the Chevrolet Camaro LM race car, which we're going to use here in just a second at the All-American Championship. These five races as a whole weren't that difficult, but I do want to take a moment to show off how frustrating racing the AI can be, especially when you consider that not every car is equal pace. So we're getting ready to start the race here. This is Seattle circuit going forward, if you will, not reverse. Never driven this car before, so turn one, getting a feel for the brakes. We come along and the Corvette just cuts us right off. I'm not saying I was blameless there, because it is hard to make these snap decisions, especially with AI that's pre-programmed. So here's another good example. I'm going to make up a ton of time on this Ford GT and go into this little chicane here ahead of it and slow down and take it a little safely, and then it just appears and knocks me off the track. I was going so much faster than the GT was, I figured a normal car would slow down and give me a chance to go through that chicane, which is pretty narrow, but that's not what happened. And so that's just another example. We're gonna fast forward ahead a little bit more to when I catch up to P1. Approaching turn one again, we're going to break later than the AI and we're gonna sneak under them here, make the second apex, and then they just turn right into me. So that was pretty annoying. And then I get my revenge as I use them as a guardrail going through that left-hander. I tended to be a little less friendly with the AI if I felt like the races were blowouts. And these, I wouldn't exactly call them blowouts, but as we fast forward ahead to the end of the championship, you'll see that it was five victories, so it really wasn't that close. So the prize car for this is very important as is a generation one C1 Corvette convertible. And we are going to use this to attempt the Spider and Roadster challenge. This is one of those things where we only really needed the Camaro to unlock this car, and that's what makes these challenges fun, is you really have to chain some wild combination of events and cars together. So here we are in the Spider and Roadster Challenge, race number one, and this is a massive A-spec point amount, and so I think we might have a problem. As we jump ahead to the start, this highlights one of the things that's kind of annoying about this game, and that the AI actually gets to start racing before you do so the ai will take off a little bit before you and as you can see we are being left behind and so late braking and smooth speed through the corners is only so helpful and what doesn't help is that this car only has two gears and so the combination of that plus the fact that you only have two laps to catch the ai on this track makes for a really, really, really difficult challenge to the point that, as you can see, we are a part of the way through lap one, almost halfway now, and we are eight and a half seconds behind. 
I pretty much decide here that there is no way I'm doing this challenge with this car without spending any money. There's just no way. And so I'm going to go ahead and just upgrade the car. But before I do that, I'm going to hop back in the Impreza touring car and do the four wheel drive challenge. But I do want to note that this challenge requires a car with standard or sports tires, which we bought previously. So you can't just normally use a race car because those come with racing tires. So I got this touring car with the assumption that I would eventually do other challenges with it after I bought the sports tire. So as you can imagine, this was very easy. Five blowout victories. And so we are creeping toward the end of this run, but first we get awarded the cool but ultimately unhelpful Toyota Motor Triathlon race car from 2004. Next, we're going to hop back into the Chevelle and hop over to the FR challenge. I failed to capture the menuing to start this, so you'll just have to trust me, bro, that this is the FR challenge. Stop me if you've heard this before. Five easy victories. This really wasn't that hard, despite me using an older car. We just kind of overpowered the AI here. And really, like my other challenges, a lot of these races aren't that hard. You just have to do them. So the reward for the FR challenge is a Nissan Skyline 2000 GTB from 1967. Cool car, ultimately not useful to the run. Next, we're going to hop back in the Impreza touring car and knock out the Turbo series of races. And as you can imagine, five more easy victories. Despite it saying 28 spec points, this race was not close at all. Really, all five of them weren't. That rewards us with a Mazda RX-7 BP Falcon, looks like a D1 GP, that's a drift car type thing from 2003. Next, we're going to do missions 25 through 29. The first five one lap magic missions. I can show all those individually if you want. Really, I just wanted to show you that I completed the fifth out of the five because we want the Toyota 7 race car from 1970, we are going to use this later. Now it's time to hop in the C1 Corvette and buy some upgrades. The first thing we're gonna buy is a supercharger for 13,000 credits. No turbos available, so the supercharger will have to do. And then we're going to buy a full customizable transmission for a total of 23,200 credits on this shopping spree. I felt like this was better than the close ratio one because the fully customizable one adds a gear or two. And so we kind of need that since the previous one only had two. Maybe overkill, but we're gonna hop back in the spider and roadster races and see what happens. And lo and behold, three easy victories. All the Corvette really needed was just a little extra power and some extra top end. And so that rewards us with the Chrysler Prowler from 2002. This is a really neat car if you've ever seen one in real life. I don't think they made that many of them. Very cool looking car, ultimately irrelevant to this run, but a cool car nonetheless. Next up is we're hopping back in the roof CTR and we're going to do a little bit of shopping and buy a stage two turbo for 14,000 credits. I did want to spend as little as possible and not just overkill this. Now we're going to jump over to the Supercar Festival, which requires a production car with over 493 horsepower. And friends, if you wanted to watch a man suffer, if you thought too many of these races were too easy, well, let me ask you this. What happens when your strategy of breaking later than the opponents doesn't work anymore? The answer is the single worst experience that I can remember in any racing game. Example number one. Well, you saw the brakes are pretty bad. Let's try again. I'm not exaggerating when I say this car had the worst brakes and handled the most poorly out of any car I handled in this game. Here's attempt number two. Trying to get on the brakes. I lose the balance of the car and then I quit out again. So here's attempt number three. I'm already annoyed because I feel like I have to break earlier than the AI. Almost lose it again. We were hard on the brakes the whole way trying to turn in and then bang off the wall 
but it wasn't so bad so we're gonna keep going at least for the moment so now we get on to the much shorter back stretch and this car is going pretty fast but these rear engine rear drive cars really can cause problems with handling you see i just barrel into the ai no thanks not gonna work i'm not gonna call that clean enough to continue so we're going to have to try again so here is attempt number four and it feels like I'm having to brake as if Fred Flintstone is sticking his feet through the bottom of the car to try and slow the car down. And once again, we almost smack into the wall again. I am big on the fundamentals of driving, like braking in a straight line and things like that. But this car's brakes are so bad. And I am still relying on the gear indicator like before. And when that doesn't work, you kind of have to wing it for yourself and you almost have to drive safely. And this car was just an absolute mess. I mean, you can see I'm feathering the throttle. I am sliding on corner exit. Just not that good. But we do have eight laps and a ton of speed in this car. So you can see I'm taking it very easy through the corners now. And I'll just go ahead and fast forward to the end of the race since we're almost at the hour mark here for this video. And just say that we did end up winning this particular attempt but the struggles are not over the next clip i'm going to show you is just kind of a microcosm of what i had to deal with with this car so we're at lap three on race number two this is fuji speedway i believe this is one of the older variants of the track i'm having a nice little battle with the ai cadillac cn you can see this roof is actually going pretty fast. If you think about Gran Turismo 7 and how fast a Group 3 car goes, they are not hitting 190 miles an hour, and they certainly have better brakes. You can see I get on the brakes before the gear indicator starts blinking, and we end up braking a little late. We started braking before the gear indicator started blinking, and we still broke too late. That is how fast we are going, and that is how poorly that thing is implemented. So we're going to come around this left-hander. I believe this is Coca-Cola in modern-day Fuji. We managed to handle that reasonably well. Now we're going to come around this right-hander here, and the car just kind of slowly understeers off the track. There was no real way to see it, no real way to tell until it was too late. Then we break too late here. I smack the Cadillac, and then I kind of give the position back because I felt like that was dirty. So here we go again, coming around this sweeping right-hander, another one. We come around the right-hander and the car just starts to slide and understeer, and then we catch a piece of the grass and the race is over. We have to try again. Fortunately, on attempt number two, we do manage to bring it home with a victory. And now I'm going to skip to the fifth race that Infineon Raceway, which I felt like would be the hardest of the three remaining races for this car. Here's attempt number one. We're going into this hairpin. And as you can see, I break late and I pretty much surrender this one. Just so frustrating to deal with this car's brakes and the gear indicator not helping at all. So here's attempt number two at Infineon Raceway. We've jumped ahead to lap three and we're in the lead, but we're going through the S's here. And this car is really tough to handle. And I get a piece of the tire barrier, manage to hold it, but then take a Gran Turismo 7 line through the grass. And then the Cadillac ushers me straight into the Shadow Realm. Oh, I already have to deal with enough, and the Cadillac is not helping. We go again. This time, we're on lap four, and we're a considerable amount away from P1. You can see that my rear tires are yellow. This car comes with sports soft tires, which you think would be great, but they don't last very long, and clearly it's not helping me at all. We catch a piece of the grass again, and then I understeer. I start to understeer into the grass, and I decide, yep, this run's not going to work either. And then finally, on my next attempt, we bring it home in P1. You can see my rear tires are absolutely cooked, but finally we are free from Infineon Raceway. And next up is New York. And if you thought my struggles were over, well, you would be wrong. The New York circuit is basically a longer and faster version of the Seoul circuit. And so you can imagine how turn one is going to go with this car that I know has terrible brakes and I have no idea where to brake. Yep, I already see what's going to happen. I'm about to plow into the AI. So let's try again. Let's see what happens this time going into turn one. I brake right when the thing starts blinking and it's actually in time this time. So we creep around the first two corners. 
looking for a spot to go through. I'm pushing the car in front of me a little bit. Now, let's see what happens. We're on the back stretch trying to find space. What will happen in this braking zone? You see, I'm already starting to prepare, starting to prepare. Yep, I brake way early. I brake in time. The AI actually fails really hard there. So, we managed to keep going. All right, we're doing a little bit better. All right, we're jumping ahead. We just made it to lap two. We are four seconds behind, but we are still on the track. How will we handle turns one and two? I try to brake a little early, and we smack into the wall, and this attempt is over. Cool. So here we go yet again in one of the worst cars I have ever driven across any racing game. And the reason that I show you all of these attempts and these struggles is, to be completely honest with you, so much of this challenge was not that challenging. A lot of the races were just ho-hum drive around the track and easy victory, as you see me elbow the AI out of the way. There was nothing easy about this. This car was extremely difficult to handle because I couldn't just outbreak the AI. You can see me being really cautious through here. I had to actually start figuring out brake points. I had to actually start paying attention to where I was braking or where I should be braking in order to not crash every other lap. Fortunately for me, this attempt mercifully ended in a victory. Fortunately, the fifth and final race was at Midfield Raceway, which I'm very familiar with. That was a first try victory, and that will get us the Cizeta V16T, which ultimately will not be relevant in the run. And friends, it's time. The Gran Turismo World Championship in the Toyota 7. I chose this one because it had a really good power to weight ratio compared to the AI. And I just want to say that if you have ever seen someone drive and you can tell that they are stressed out, you will see it here in this race. I just plowed the AI out of the way like a true patriot. And this was my third attempt. So I'm only showing you this attempt for now, but you can see I am bouncing off the walls. I am checking my mirrors. As I start to warm up to this track and car combination, you will see I end up driving this thing about as fast as you can possibly drive. And the thing is, driving on a controller with a car this fast on a track this narrow is extremely difficult. I cannot express how difficult this is. And doing it at a rate that stays in front of the AI is even harder. So here's an example. That corner can be taken much faster, but I didn't know it at the time. So we're on lap one. We're just trying to make it around the track. On my previous two attempts, one time I pitted just to see what the time loss was and things like that. That didn't work out. The first attempt I had, I ended up coming in second place and I wanted to see if I could win because I felt like I needed to win all of the races. The more points, the better. To explain what I mean, we're going to jump ahead to lap eight. I'm in P1 less than two seconds ahead this is me pushing the car about as hard as I can. I'm familiar with the track enough now at this point, but I just wanted to try and talk over this without hopefully making it too boring. As to what it's like to try and drive this car full bore, but know that there's some kind of, I'm not sure if they were LMP1 cars back in the day or exactly what they were, cars that the AI could easily catch up to me in. And you can see I'm just, I'm peeking backwards, even mid corner, which really isn't a smart idea. Just trying to get a gauge for how close is the AI to me. And so right now, I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job staying ahead. Here you see I'm taking this left-hander much faster than I did in the first lap. Just trying to get a feel for it, but I've lost time to the AI. I was 1.8 seconds ahead before. Now I'm only 1.5 seconds ahead. Another peek back, you can see the AI is getting closer and closer and closer, and then I bounce off the wall, which is dangerous in this part of the track, and I end up taking that left-hander kind of slow. You can take that left-hander slower than you think. It's so narrow, but still getting nervous here. 
This is already kind of stressful. The AI takes that last hairpin really, really poorly. So if you can get a run on the straightaway, you can beat them to the line. So far, so good. Two more laps to go. We've opened a 2.2 second gap on the car behind. Just trying to make it through. We get to the first right-hander, but then I've lost some time to the AI. Once again, a couple tenths just in that one corner. You see my tires are yellow. I'm in an old Toyota race car. Here we go around this long right-hander here. You can stick it in fourth and just kind of plant it and let the uh, stability management and traction control hold it together. Still doing okay. Down to third. I'll probably have another quick peek back in a moment. I'm glancing at the mini map a lot. If you had a webcam on my face, you would see that I am looking around constantly at the map, looking behind me. I am certain there was a stressed out look on my face. Look, we're down to eight tenths of a second lead and we still have a lap and a half to go. Something else to consider in this whole thing is that I have to question if, and the AI is right on my tail now. You have to question if every race is going to be this difficult and this stressful. Is it really worth using this car or is it possible there could be something else? I break a little late into the final hairpin and then I get rammed by the AI into the wall. Oh no. All right, we have one lap to get our position back and I can assure you in this moment, I was thinking about bulldozing the AI out of the way. Oh, you saw me give him a little nudge on the way by. It was my... uh love tap as i like to call it breaking into turn one here we go first right hander we kind of hold it you can see my left rear tire is starting to turn orange which is not good quick peek back three tenths lead down into second in the first left hander here now we have this big oval like right hander here down into fourth like usual going around and around i overdrive it just a little can't get the traction, and fortunately the AI doesn't get a great run, so we go down to the third for the left-handers here. Now there's two AI behind me, which might be a problem. Down the backstretch here, still in P1, just half a lap to go. We take this as fast as we can, and then I bump the inside, and there goes the AI into P1, and I can't keep up. I've completely lost my mojo, and my tires are now completely messed up, and there goes my chance at a victory in race one and you can believe after as stressed out as i was and as careful as i was for nine and a half laps it was pretty disheartening to blow it on the final lap but i end up sticking it out thinking okay i'll just see what happens in the next race because this is a 10 race series i almost catch the ai only a four tenths loss there so we finished P2. That's a decent point result. Let's see what happens in race two, which is super speedway, which should be easy enough. So here we are. Race two is 21 laps at super speedway. The Toyota 7 has decent top end speed. So let's see what we can do with it. Three and a half seconds behind P1 for the moment. The question is going to be whether or not this car has good enough aero to make up the difference. And you can see on the turn three and four, if you will, I did not do a very good job of that. So we're off to a poor start. 3.3 seconds behind now. Fortunately, you don't really have to take much off for turns one and two. But I'm not in the toe of the cars in front of me, which is kind of a problem. And this goes back to what I was saying before about the AI getting to drive off before I get to do anything. So now we're two and a half seconds behind, but it looks like the car that was in P1 is no longer in P1, so that's going to be kind of a problem for us. On our way to lap three, how far behind are we? 2.3 seconds off of P1. See if we can close the gap just a little bit. You can see I can drag the brake a little bit. I was not able to do that until I was using the right stick as the throttle and brake. So the AI crashed into turns one and two. So now we're up into P5, 2.9 seconds behind. Okay, we're doing all right, doing all right. We're starting to make up ground and then I overdrive it into three and four again. But we might now be in the toe of the two cars in front of us and I think we are 3.2 seconds behind. Then the Chaparral gets out of the way. Now we are coming up on the Nissan R390. 
Can we make a move on it? On lap four, drove a little bit erratically there. Yes, we're going to go flying past this car, but there's a problem. We're actually losing time to P1. 3.6 seconds behind now, and if I can't get in the toe of P1, look, good example. The Nissan went flying past me, and here's what I know. 4.3 seconds behind. This isn't going to work. And so we're going to have to go to our backup plan, which if you are observant, you might see what it is, but we're going to have to unlock the endurance races and you can only do that through completing 25% of the game. And so real quickly, I'm going to run through what all I did to get to 25% of the game at this point. So I did this one, one lap magic event, and then I did all of the first 10 missions, the pass missions. From there, we did the Japan Championship in the Impreza Touring Car. Then we did the All Japan GT Championship in the Toyota 7 race car. It gets some redemption after losing in the Gran Turismo World Championship. Then we do Club Z with the 350Z LM race car. Then we do Schwarzwald Liga B in the roof. Yeah, we have to use that car again. That was pretty fun. Then we do La Festa Italiano with the Cizeta V16T. That wasn't fun. Then we did three of the Type R meeting races with the NSXR concept, all to get the 25% completion, which gives us an Audi that we are not going to use. But what that does unlock is the endurance races, and we're going to do the El Capitan race, which is 66 laps in the Option Stream Z, this ended up being a blowout. This really wasn't competitive at all, so there's no reason for me to show much of it at all. You just replace your tires every eight or nine laps or so, and you'll be just fine. I won this race by two laps, so it was quite easy. And that unlocks a very special car that will be useful, the Minolta Toyota. 88 CV race car from 1989 and friends it's time to try the GT World Championship one more time so when I was doing a lot of research for this run I saw that the Minolta Toyota or I saw that someone said the Minolta Toyota in the right hands would be more than capable of winning this race but they suggested a tire change which we are trying not to do and already we are in P1 at the end of Sector 1, so this is going a lot better so far. But I am on racing medium tires. I don't know what the AI is on, but tire wear could come into play in some of these races. So our first trip around the half circle right-hander here, so far so good. Now down into third gear for the left-hander here. We are leaving the AI behind at least for the moment. Yes, this is looking much better. Much, much better. Oh, for crying out loud. <sighs> okay, all right. So, it was looking good. Now we gotta try again. And then on attempt number two, we win every race easily, except for this one because I pitted like a doofus and ended up throwing this race away. But we won nine out of the 10 races, ending up with 93 total points. The races weren't really all that close. And we bring it home without buying a single car. If you think trucks do not count as cars. If you do, then no, it's impossible and we couldn't do it. But if you don't believe trucks are cars, then yes, we did this without buying a single car. And of course, that rewards us with the iconic Ford GT LM race car spec 2, which you can drive on Gran Turismo 7 today. And that wraps up our run on Gran Turismo 4. We were able to beat the game buying only a truck and spending a total of 80,250 credits. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. There will be more content soon. If you've been following the channel for the last couple of months, you might know what's coming up next, Gran Turismo 5. We will be attempting a challenge run on that and the remaining Gran Turismo games here in the future. If you have any ideas for challenge runs you might like to see, leave a comment on the video and let me know your thoughts. 
I appreciate all of the comments I get and try to respond to them when I can. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. And until next time, see ya!